week's topics, location and planning, soil prep, uh, watering, fertilizer, planting, and weeds and disease. Uh, you may notice that some of these topics, or most of them, um, would be, I mean, they could easily be covered in 30 to 45 minutes, but uh, we're going to put them all together so you, you have some good basics for starting uh, this garden or uh, getting restarted. So the first, uh, first one is location and plan. We're going to start out with uh, a garden location that has full sun, well-drained soil, and really is competition free. So what is considered full sun? It's really six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Uh, I will admit we get uh, calls into extension saying, I have four hours direct sunlight, uh, two hours dappled, and one part shade, and one shade. Is that going to work? I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, really, uh, any kind of gardening is about experimenting. So uh, even though 68 hours is best for most vegetables, um, if that's the only space that you have available, then we say go for it and see, you know, see what happens. Um, the second part, well-drained fertile soil. Obviously, you know, don't choose a spot where you know water stands. Um, you know, in general, it's going to really take some time to um, get to a place where, you know, you're really happy with, you know, your spot, the soil, everything included. Uh, but there are some steps that we can take that we'll talk about today. Uh, going into competition free, that is just not competition with sunlight. It also means uh, nearby roots uh, for uh, competing with resources. So even if you have a really large established tree, uh, those it, that's gonna be fairly close to the garden, uh, that's gonna be some serious competition. And it's not really something that you can, you know, there's any really wiggle room. So just be aware of a lot of established trees and shrubs and try to um, stay away from those areas. Airflow and foot access. So airflow between plants is super important because uh, it does help prevent overcrowding and when pla plants do get overcrowding and there's not a lot of airflow uh, between those plants, it does provide really ideal conditions for disease and pests. And then once that started, uh, then it just pro proliferates from there. So we want to try to avoid that. And then the foot access. So this picture is a beautiful raised bed, uh, which is really great for planting, watering, harvesting without as much bending over. Uh, so it's a lot, um, it's a lot better for our backs, but uh, also those with disabilities. So again, looking at the surface uh, where you're walking, that is a really nice surface. Um, to walk on or if, uh, you know, if there's wheelchair chairs that are moving through there. Um, I'm just really impressed with how beautiful that wood is. Are we not all envious? Look at the stain and just how pristine it is. Uh, I am gonna go jump back to this picture just to kind of compare uh, space and access. Uh, obviously these vegetables are spaced out. Uh, I do see some larger spaces in between that uh, could be used for foot access. But the one thing I notice when I look at this is if it is raining, that is gonna be a muddy mess. Uh, so just be aware that there's enough room for you to walk, uh, but also what's it gonna be like in inclement weather too? Uh, you know, you can easily put some pavers down. So you can keep the, um, keep uh, in mind uh, how we're gonna access uh, through that garden. and then water access. Uh, obviously consider the location of the water source. Uh, will the hose even reach? Uh, if it does reach, do you have to, you know, uh, you know carry it, you know, uh, you know, 100, you know, 100 feet away? Um, also a closer, a garden that's closer to your home will more likely be used than one placed further away. Um, I know even just with herbs, uh, there are times where I don't wanna, <laughs> You know, we all do it, right? Um, you know, whatever's closer to that back door is just going to be more um, just utilized a little bit better. 
Uh, looking at the plan in this photo, uh, one thing I'll point out is they do have the taller plants in the back and some shorter plants in the front. So you won't have to, um, as you're getting in there trying to care for plants, monitor and harvest, uh, it's going to be a lot easier. And of course, they have a nice uh, stoned path right there um, that really puts a nice definition between your footpath and the garden. And the last part of location and plan is really start small if you haven't started yet. Uh, you really want to set yourself up for success and uh, biting off more, more than you can chew may seem fun, but is it going to bring you that success? And we want you to have successful gardens so that way you keep wanting to do it and build on that knowledge. Um, so if you do start a little bit smaller, you can build on knowledge each season. Uh, if you have existing beds, uh, you just want to be sure to clean out any leftover plants if you haven't done so already or any debris. So that way your bed is already uh, for the very next step. Uh, selection. I'm not going to go over this whatsoever um, because Paul Winsky is going to talk about this in two weeks. Uh, so he'll help uh, you decide what you want to grow. But various vegetables do take up a different space. So you, that really needs to come into play with your plan. Uh, if you have a very small garden space and you want to have at least six different vegetables, uh, planning a big head of cauliflower is probably may, may not be for you. So uh, keep that in mind too. And then lastly, take notes. I know we always think we're going to remember everything and then we forget everything. <laughs> so it's all learning experience. Um, we can't possibly remember all the small details. So recording that information, especially specific to your, um, your, your area and what you're growing, uh, really helps. And that also helps with lighting questions too. Um, you know, like I brought up earlier, uh, if you're not sure how much sunlight your yard gets, you know, monitor it for a couple weeks. Um, of course, that that light's going to be a little bit different between winter and summer, uh, but you can have a good idea of how many uh, how many hours of direct sunlight you can get just by monitoring. And this is the last slide. The um, all the other slides were pictures of in-ground gardens, uh, but you can have a garden anywhere. You can easily garden in containers. Uh, the upper left is a balcony, the bottom uh, right is a, is a patio, uh, even there's a windowsill. Um, and in some ways, when you have a container gardening, uh, you actually can control some of these factors that we're going to talk about in a minute a little bit better, especially with soil. You can grow uh, regular sized uh, vegetables. If you have larger pots, I would say at least a five gallon pot. Uh, but if you have smaller pots, there are still a lot of varieties to choose from, uh, you know, like cucumbers, beans, um, things like that, that will grow. Uh, they're either, they either have bush varieties or they have certain varieties that are grown specifically for containers. So do not let containers hold you back. All right, our second topic is soil prep. You know, the whole, um, the entire point of the soil is to have good drainage and good nutrients. Uh, if you are using an existing garden site, uh, you may have decent soil to start. If not, then you'll have some steps to take. Uh, as said before, vegetables and herbs like really well-drained, nutritious soil. Um, so what does that soil uh, provide? It, it provides to the plant nutrients, uh, the ability to retain those nutrients, uh, and then it provides air for oxygen and then the water. So when we look at this chart here, let's keep all those things in mind. So starting in the bottom left, uh, sandy soils, those are the largest particles. They simply don't hold enough water. Uh, so that obviously reduces the availability of water, thus uh, reducing nutrients. 
uh, silt to the right are smaller particles. Uh, kind of think about flour, uh, a little bit of that texture. Uh, but clay up at the top, those are the smallest particles. And they hold together when they are wet so much that they can actually feel sticky. And if you've ever dug in <laughs> to some really bad clay, you know what I mean. Um, this is because there isn't much air in between those particles. So that reduces uh, the ability to pull those, nit or those nutrients out. Um, ironically enough, clay does have a lot of nutrients. Uh, it's just not accessed because of that lack of air. So in general, uh, in a perfect world, we would ask for, <laughs> we would, uh, our goal would be 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. And this is uh, for vegetable and herb gardens. This is definitely not uh, a mixture that you would like to put together when you're planting, you know, like something like a tree. Um, a tree needs to have more of the soil that's uh, around uh, where it's growing. So for vegetables and herbs. So our entire purpose here is really to try to create the best medium for, uh, for your seeds, seedlings, transplants. And amendments add those nutrients. Um, it can add nutrients, uh, makes soil more workable, uh, it loosens real heavy soils, or it can actually uh, bind real sandy soils. So three of these, uh, three of these uh, things can be added be right before planting, um, as long as they're tilled in. So compost, uh, sand, and expanded shale, uh, those all can be added in right before. Uh, the compost, it helps loosen really heavy soil, it aerates the soil, and then obviously it adds nutrients. Uh, retail compost is really ready for the garden. Uh, hum let me say this again, home compost, <laughs> uh, it really needs to go through that process of decomposition. Uh, sandy soils, or sand, I mean, sand um, helps loosen heavy soil. And then of course it adds in a little bit of air and water. And then expanded shale may be the one that some of you um, have not heard of before. And this loosens poor soil, it improves drainage, and it helps hold water better. So what this is, is, is it's a um, sedimentary rock that is kiln fired to create like this coarse material. It's really similar to kitty litter. And that is also something just like with the sand that, you know, you don't have to necessarily do every year. Uh, but uh, organic, matter like leaves and grass clippings, uh, they really need to be uh, broken down and turned under the soil. Uh, both of these items are really high in nitrogen and I said they do need to be broken down and the reason is is even though they are really high in nitrogen, the process of breaking those down uh, pulls nitrogen from the soil which means that it pulls nitrogen from the plants growing. Uh, so you want those to go through a decomposition process before. Um, for a compost pile, uh, or actually with the leaves, with any kind of leaves or grass clippings, what you can do is put them down in a fall garden. If you do not intend to have a fall garden, you can put those down, uh, till them in, and then that will uh, allow them to um, to break down. Uh, we at Extension, we're very fond of leaving grass clippings on the lawn, but there are certain situations where, um, you know, there's really grassy situations that have gotten out of control and it's just too much. So that may be um, a situation for the grass. And leaves, uh, most deciduous leaves break down beautifully. Uh, this picture is of oak leaves. They are thicker. So, uh, they would really benefit from some kind of mulching or running the mower over. If you can help break down some of those bigger pieces, it just quickens that decomposition process. 
And I just want to touch on soil prep for containers, which is usually um, comprised of uh, bags that you buy. So those bags are usually a mixture of soil, compost, peat moss, and vermiculite. Um, this is not a mix that you know you necessarily want to put into the ground. Uh, it is very light. Um, and the one tip I have, uh, I'll tell you my technique when I'm filling up pots, whether they're short or tall, is that uh, soil absorbs, wet soil absorbs water better than dry soil. So uh, a lot of those bags are really dry. So I will probably do it in about thirds, depending on how tall it is. I uh, add the soil, add water, mix it all up. Uh, make sure that it looks all moist and then um, fill it up that way. Then you get up to the top. Um, so that way, when you go to plant your plants, either seeds or transplants, uh, you are working with an adequately moist soil. Uh, that soil, if you go to um, ball it up in your hand, should kind of create a ball, but definitely not wring water out. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on soil testing because Shannon Dietz actually did our homegrown talk two weeks ago on soil testing. So uh, if you've attended these talks before, you uh, probably received that link. But I'm going to go over it real quickly. Um, and it's not really important the words on there, but I'm showing you the two areas to fill out uh, the top area with your information. The bottom area that just asks um, where is the soil coming from in your yard? You know, is it your front flower bed? Is it your back vegetable bed? Uh, there is a cost, so it takes your payment information. And down at the bottom where it says $12, most homeowners uh, really just need the test um, number one or two. Number one is $12. Uh, if you go back up and look at the title of this, uh, you will find this uh this the one that you need under urban so you may look for homeowner but it's under urban under the forms and then how you do that in real short <laughs> real short uh, how you take a soil sample remove the organic matter on the top uh, take your hand spade down about six inches and pull that soil out do that eight to ten times you can put that in a quart size ziploc bag we do have soil sample bags here at Extension, but you don't need it. If that's what's holding you up, you don't need it. You can just put it in a quart size Ziploc bag, mail that off, and you usually get your results within, you know, at least two weeks, maybe a week. Uh, January, February are really heavy times for farmers submitting. So uh, if you're looking for a really quick turnaround uh, right about now, it just might take, uh, it might take up to two weeks then. And if you have not done a soil test, uh, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do that because when you're thinking about fertilizers, how do you know what your soil needs if you don't know what it already has? So uh, these are really good to do maybe every two to three years. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna go back and I'm just gonna see if there's any questions so far. Uh, Shannon, do you see any uh, questions? Yeah. Um, sorry if I'm echoing. You're echoing. Oh, um, so I apologize. Paul, are you still not able to see the question? Yes, I, I, I cannot see the, uh, the okay. questions. OK, so you're so, going to have to take it. OK, I just didn't want to repeat anything. So um, how about helping with this one? Um, somebody is asking if perlite is good to add to a soil mix for raised garden beds. I was told that it was bad for worms, but couldn't find anything to back this person's claim. Um, I probably wouldn't add that just because, uh, well, and it depends where you are. Here in Houston, uh, you know, we want our soil to retain a little bit more moisture and uh, we don't want it to drain too much. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would not use perlite in an in-ground type uh, mix. Uh, if you're doing containers, that's fine, um, but I would not add it to the native soil as an amendment. 
All right. Um, another question. If I'm adding store bought mix and I'm trying to answer most of these questions, but these are some I just can't get to. If I'm adding store bought salt to mix into my flower bed, what type is best? All purpose garden or top soil? And I don't think there's really a good um, answer there because sometimes the the um, the all purpose mix can be really too light. So it would depend on uh, the ratio, how much you're adding in. Uh, and then topsoil, uh, it, that would depend on your current level of um, whatever your soil is right now. Um, if you just kind of have decent soil, you could add maybe um, a half and half mixture of both. Uh, I just wouldn't um, go with one or the other. Paul, what's your what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. The, the, the all purpose mix is, is, is probably a good first step, but uh, adding some of that topsoil, uh, depending on uh, the overall you know, structure of that soil um, isn't going to hurt it also. Um, and, I, and I like the idea of, of not one or the other. Um, now, costs will come into play uh, if one is more expensive. Uh, so, you know, take that into account. But, uh, you know, a mix of them or actually just a good, if you either buy a good compost or if you make your own compost and you work that into the top two to three inches of soil, um, that's going to work just as well. Yep, and we're going to get there too. <laughs> oh, we did. We already just went over it. <laughs> OK, um, Shannon, I'm going to go ahead and then we'll we'll just check on That's questions. Fine. Do you have? Um, I have more, but we'll we'll catch up later. OK, all right. All right, watering. Um, so some people hate it, some people love it. <laughs> if you are starting a new garden, uh, definitely, as I mentioned before, see where your water source is and make sure that it's close by. If you have an established garden, uh, you may have plenty of experience with your watering and this is the year that you want to assess like what, you know, how do I make this better? Um, this first top, this top part, uh, I felt like this kid pulling this hose for so many years. So having a vegetable garden, um, you know, out of the way a little bit, uh, it seems like it uh, might make sense just with the structure of your yard. But if you're having to pull that hose on a regular basis, it really gets old. So either have it close by or have some other um, setup. I, I really love this hose reel on the bottom left. Um, I think we've all seen the ones that are uh, lower and the idea is they have wheels and we can move them, but they're so low to the ground and that hose is so heavy that sometimes it's really hard to actually pull it anywhere. Um, so this one, um, this one seemed like uh, it just made a lot a lot more sense and then of course uh, the nozzle I like to bring that up because you know uh, it really does make things a whole lot easier if you invest in a decent nozzle that has a lot of variations that can help you um, water better you may uh, you may prefer one over the other the the regular sprinkle that they have that on, that's that's pretty, um, that's my go-to. But if something needs to be deep watered, uh, there may be a trickle on there and then you can lower the pressure on the water. So all these things kind of combine to make a better watering experience. And, um, and then of course, uh, the use of hoses may just pull you to, you know, try to consider irrigation at some point. So how much water? Uh, really, there, it's, a, it's a balance between too much and too little. Uh, the goal for an in-ground garden is about one inch of rain, um, that, or one inch of water. Uh, that includes rain, irrigation, um, or, you know, by hand. Uh, if it is, uh, if it's about to rain a lot, you do want to compensate, maybe turn off that irrigation uh, for, the, for a short time. Uh, and of course, this can, can really increase depending on the heat uh, or if you have in -ground garden, uh, an in-ground garden or containers. Uh, around Houston, 
you know, I mean, it can be super rainy or it can be really hot and really dry. Um, so part of that is intuition too. Uh, but the containers will definitely dry out uh, very quick, quickly. So a lot of those tend to need to be watered every day. Ideally, when you water, um, you should be able to look into the soil and that water has reached down six inches. Um, I have a technique with watering um, that uh, I, I've always done, um, which is it's going back to, you know, wet, wet soil or will absorb water better than dry soil. So I will tend to go over um, a garden or, you know, the pots um, for a minute or so, and then I'll go back with a second, um, a second watering. Uh, because if you just go over the one time, I would challenge you. You, you, could, you could water it for three or four minutes, and I would challenge you to look down if it's been real dry. Um, you will notice that it, sometimes it's just the mulch that's wet. So, you know, be aware right there. Um, but on the other hand, you can water too much also, especially vegetables. Um, this can really create, if you're out there watering an in-ground garden every single day, you can really create um, sh really shallow independent roots. Um, so they're all near the surface and, you know, they're just waiting for their daily watering. Um, so you do want to encourage that plant to send roots a little bit deeper so it, you um, it creates a better uh, root system. So the method, obviously there's hand watering. Um, you know, this one, actually I'll go back to this one. I, I use this on purpose because it was just, it just seems so absurd to me. Um, <laughs> it looks like a decent sized garden, but I would never water by hand with a pail. Um, but you know, everybody's individual and, and that may be something that you really enjoy. Um, so going back to method, hand watering, hose, um, uh, but really the best situation would be a drip irrigation so that that uh, soil is watered, but the leaves aren't. Most vegetable leaves do not like to be watered. Uh, this also helps reduce runoff. So where the water is going is exactly where it needs to be, right where those roots are. Um, and uh, it, so it does use water more wisely. And again, with the rain, when you have irrigation, just be aware of the rain. Um, you know, you don't need to do, you know, if we get a heavy rain, uh, you don't need to keep your irrigation on. Going into fertilizers, so this really is a topic that can make even most of the experienced home gardeners ask questions. Uh, and it's definitely not the final answer to all the problems. Sometimes I think if we see a yellow leaf, it's like, oh my gosh, it needs fertilizer. Uh, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, if you have shade or competition, uh, that can be, uh, that can impact uh, those plants. And the amount depends also on the soil. We talked about clay versus uh, sandy earlier. Clay soil will hold fertilizer longer than sandy soil, which means that sandy soil may need more fertilizer, but you can't do it heavily. You actually have to do it more often at a more diluted concentration. All right, so the, this is going into what it is, right? Um, we're only gonna uh, focus on the primary nutrients, uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. If it has all three of these, it is a complete uh, fertilizer and that's what we want to use. There are organic and inorganic fertilizers. Uh, an example of organic is like horse manure, bone meal. Uh, inorganic is man-made. Um, but the inorganic, uh, the advantage is, is they, it does have more nutrient density. So you need less of it compared to the organic fertilizer. Today, we're just really gonna focus on nitrogen. Uh, Nitrogen, you know, really helps with that green growth. Uh, roots, leaves, 
stems from flowers, fruits, everything, the whole shebang. Um, if you have now, if you do have a lot of yellow and leaves, it's not only just nitrogen, lack of nitrogen, but it could indicate a lack of um, nitrogen. But if you have too much, it, kill, it can kill your plants. Um, and also, if you have that nitrogen off, it can produce a lot of green leaves, but not actually flowers and fruit. Um, so again, that's where the soil test comes in handy. And then using, um, using the right fertilizer for vegetable gardens. Uh, in general, we can use a mix that has two times the phosphorus. Uh, so for example, you would see at the store a 10, 20, 10. So basically that would have 10 pounds of nitrogen, 10 or 20 pounds of phosphorus, and 10 pounds of potassium. And say that's a 100 pound bag. So you basically have 40 pounds of nutrients in there. Uh, let me see. And then the other two, um, it's just there's not as much of a problem with runoff, um, but the lack of phosphorus and potassium, it really can uh, create a stunted plants. How much? That's the big question, right? In ground gardens, if you have 100 square feet, you'll use two to three pounds. And we will always, always recommend that you go back to the label and uh, just look at the directions. Uh, we can give you guidelines, but you really need to follow uh, labels on individual um, fertilizers and chemicals. For container gardens, um, I guess it is possible to dissolve some of that complete uh, uh, fertilizer that you have in water, it would make uh, a really high concentrate. Uh, I think for container gardening, uh, it's much easier to do a water soluble fertilizer or a time release. And uh, the time release are usually in those pellets and then the water soluble, you, you mix it in with water and pour it over. So those can be found at garden centers. And I wanted to bring up garden centers because these small local businesses, they are really excellent resources. Um, you know, they do this every single day. And some of these are all family owned and they've been, you know, their father did it and now the daughter's, <laughs> you know, in the business. So they've been doing this for decades sometimes. So they do this every day and they can help you uh, really pick out your fertilizer needs, whether it's for uh, in ground or uh, pots. And method. So, okay, I have this fertilizer. What the heck do I do with it now? Uh, so in ground gardens, you apply to the soil uh, according to the label, of course, and then till in, and then you are ready for planting. So you're gonna mix that fertilizer in before planting. With containers, uh, the time release, so those pellets are mixed in with the soil and then you plant. Water soluble fertilizers, uh, you want to use those once the once the plants start growing. So if you do have seeds, uh, you always just want to use plain water with that and only start using fertilizer once the plant starts growing. And I would say that's a that's a generally um, popular question. All right, going back to fertilizer questions. Shannon, any questions? Talking, oh, talking to me? Okay. Um, I'm a little behind on the questions, so I'm just going to... Just pick a couple good ones. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, hold on. I'm going through some of them that I... Um, okay, somebody is wanting, are bulk vegetable planting mixes adequate for use in raised beds and I asked about bulk planting mixes they're ex they're talking about places that deliver soil by the yard um 
Yeah, yeah I mean, I didn't, I didn't quite hear everything, but if you're buying it from the yard from a nursery uh, for a soil mix for gardens, uh, what was the question? Would it apply to pots or in ground um, or raised? Raised beds. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say definitely. The raised beds are going to more mimic the in ground um, soils, uh, just not exactly because obviously you have more control over raised beds than, you know, like if you're dealing with a hard clay. Okay. Um, what are good sources for, okay, this is a good one. What are good sources for only nitrogen? My saw is fine on potassium and phosphorus. Um, well, I mean, going to uh, one of the garden centers, there are different mixtures. Um, obviously using some organic materials sometimes uh, ahead of time can add a lot of nitrogen, nitrogen in like the um, leaves or grass, but there are various types of fertilizers that are sold that may just have nitrogen, but the other two numbers are zero. So Paul, can, like Urea, can we give them examples of? Yeah, uh, Shannon, I think the most common one you're gonna find is a 2100, um, which is often, uh, it, which is pretty readily available. Okay. Uh, and and that's, that's actually recommended quite often um because our phosphorus levels and potassium levels usually aren't an issue um but yeah once these plants start growing they're they're pulling nitrogen out of the soil plus nitrogen um easily moves through the soil profile uh it's very mobile so um a 2100 is going to be your best bet okay you have time for one more or no sure um so the question is what is the minimum depth of soil that should be in a raised bed? I mean, really, that's just uh, that's really up to the homeowner and their their particular situation. I mean, we have some raised beds that are, you know are about six inches above, but then you saw those uh, raised beds that had uh, the the three pretty thick logs uh, that were really tall enough, you know, for um, really no bending over so there's there's different types of raised beds it just depends what you're looking for well and it depends on the crop too mm -hmm. um, yeah so this question i'm answering and this will be the last one but you might want to address it more uh talking about fertilizers expiration dates um do we need to buy annually not annually but you definitely need to check the expiration date because they do um they do break down um and especially in the conditions that i mean like we have a lot of high humidity days here uh like a lot of the granular granular fertilizers will tend to clump up and stuff like that so y'all can expand on that if y'all like um i mean i liked what i liked what you answered if paul has anything else but yeah i mean a lot of that is just um just sort of reading the label and I would be more concerned with if you're not going to use it, how is it going to be disposed of? Um, there are certain ways to dispose of extra fertilizer. We don't really want to get into that today, but um, the one way you don't want to do is just to put it down. Um, I know there's a whole thought, you know, more is better, but when it comes to fertilizer, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and we don't want to um, purposely add that into our waterways either. All right. OK, well, I will go ahead and we'll continue with some questions uh, when I finish up. All right, planting. So planting early, um, but after the last frost date. Uh, here in Houston, we have uh, far fewer issues with the ground being cold, uh, but there is still a chance of frost. Uh, if you're not in this area, then uh, you know you may you may struggle with that a little bit uh, more than we do. But you know you certainly still don't want to invest in putting a garden in um, and taking that chance. And then you know we do have a frost. Uh, if you st start seeds indoors, um, it usually is about six to eight weeks before the last frost date. 
um, here in Harris County. This is our vegetable garden planting dates. Texas has one, but we, we're not going to use that here in Houston because we're mostly 9A. Um, and this was just uh, redone a couple years ago from a horticulture agent. And because of where we are, um, you know, we can grow things uh, more in earlier, uh, really late winter uh, into the fall and then less, um, less vegetables in, in midsummer. But um, for example, I will show you at the bottom, there are the two arrows showing you the last freeze dates. And just to kind of, um, really make them super obvious. <laughs> this is the last freeze date. This is um, the first freeze date. Um, so uh, we have two just because of uh, our region. So the first one would be down in Hobby. Uh, so the last uh, um, freeze date is really mid-February up towards Bush International. It's gonna be closer to, to March. Um, but this is for Houston, Texas, and Harris County. If you are outside of our county um, or state, you can contact your local extension office. Uh, they may not have something um, as specific as this, but they can help you with your local planting recommendations. Uh, then getting into seeds and transplants. Uh, if you are using seeds, then uh, the labels are pretty good at giving you all the information that you need. Uh, if you don't follow the label, then uh, you your seeds just may not uh, germinate as successfully. But in general, the larger the seed, uh, the more soil needs to be uh, over top of them. Some of those really tiny seeds, I mean, you can just sprinkle um, and then just sprinkle a little soil on top and, and you're done. Um, but in this case, you can see some rows have been um, have been trenched out a little bit. Uh, oh, there is this chart over um, underneath here. Uh, some plants really do transplant easier than others, um, as this chart shows, which really comes down to they just don't like their roots uh, disturbed. <laughs> so. Um, so there's, there's definitely some choices when Paul goes over uh, the vegetable varieties. There are certain plants that you just want to really use seed out in the garden because you're just going to get a better yield. Um, and this is from the Texas Home Gardening, uh, Vegetable Gardening Guide. Uh, uh, Paul or Shannon, um, if they didn't insert that, they'll, they'll go ahead and put that in. That Vegetable Gardening Guide is a really good overall um, information uh, just about starting a garden. Uh, the only other thing, kind of this example of the seed in this man's hands, is that some seeds really have a hard outer shell. And if you just relied on them to um, germinate with their, you know, by their own internal clocks, it might be a really long time. Uh, so they need a little help. Sometimes they need to be nicked or um, scratched with some sandpaper or um, my method that I like is I just like to soak them in a wet paper towel. And then the last thing with uh, planting seeds is thinning. Um, something I'm terrible with, really, I'll be honest. <laughs> you put all those seeds down, you get all those cute little plants coming up, and then you're like, I have to decide which ones of you lives. Um, but I encourage you to, um, to, to do your best to thin, um, because, uh, you know, if you don't, then your plants just will not create the crop that they need to, especially like carrots. Uh, you know, they're obviously, if there's a lot of them together, you're just not going to get a normal sized carrot because what we eat is the root growing underground. And thin these when they are small, because if you wait until they're older, um, you are disrupting the roots all around those, um, those other um, seedlings that you want to keep. And then of course, using transplants, um, just one last comment on that. Um, it does give you a little jump on uh, on the growing season. You know, you, all kind of like the hard work, you know, has been done with getting them 
uh, you know, from seed to seedling. So uh, if you plant transplants, then that just gives you a little bit longer, um, perhaps a longer uh, harvest time, but also it's quicker to the time you're able to harvest. Uh, but we'll go into planting depth. Um, generally, uh, when you have a transplant or if you buy um, something like this from the store, uh, you want to keep it at the current soil level. Um, you don't want to plant it too deep. You don't want to, you don't want the roots to show. Uh, an one of the exceptions though is tomato, what you see here. Um, tomatoes are really cool because you can par uh, plant part of that stem and the little nodules on those stems will all grow roots. So one way to create a more extensive root system for tomatoes is to actually plant this sideways. So you will lay it down uh, and plant part of that stem and then gently kind of guide the top of the plant up and uh, it'll reorient and it'll just start growing straight up but uh, that's a way to kind of cheat and get more roots on some of um, these tomatoes. And the last topic, weeds and disease. Um, so manual control uh, is really easier for most home gardens and usually that's all that's needed. Uh, this picture um, really uh, shows a tool that's helpful for your back, <laughs> you know, a hoe with a, a long handle. Um, but there may be others like me where I find weeding very therapeutic. So uh, my I get very excited after it rains because I know that the soil is uh, workable and I sit down and I just start weeding. So if, if, you, if you're like that, um, you kind of enjoy that, that part of it. Uh, I think it is very meditative. Uh, when it comes to weeding, uh, it will help to prevent weeds uh, if you mulch. Uh, this not only uh, reduces weeds, but it helps retain moisture. Uh, and and by, in some cases, uh, the temperature was um, the temperature uh, above the ground was there was a really big difference uh, below beneath that mulch. Uh, if you don't mulch, uh, you'll just have to keep up better on those weeds. And depending on where you are, I mean, what you don't want to see are weeds that are bigger than your plants, because if those weeds are growing, um, it's just not that they're there, they're actually taking away the resources from what you are growing. Uh, let's see, oh, and the options. So options for mulch uh, would be straw, uh, leaves, some leaves that have already, um, you know, been setting out, uh, compost or hardwood mulch. Uh, I think one of the other um, common mistakes is not putting enough down. Sometimes people put down a really thin layer that if the wind blows or it rains, you can see through it. Well, if you're putting that thing thin of a layer, it's really not going to help with retaining moisture or uh, preventing weeds. Uh, you want like a good, you know, at least two inches, if not three. And IPM in monitoring your garden. IPM is integrated pest management. Uh, this really means preventing pest problems the best you can before they happen. Uh, and this, um, it really does rely on you monitoring on a regular basis. So our goal is to avoid chemical use when possible, especially in the garden. Uh, if you have to use it, you want to be very, very selective because if you're not, then you're going to be killing the beneficial insects also, and it's going to kind of throw everything off in a downward spiral. Uh, but some pests are just they're really easily handled. Um, aphids, you can spray those off with a hose. Uh, if they're adult leaf-footed bugs, uh, you, they're pretty big. You can easily knock them into a pail of soapy water. Uh, but when monitoring comes in handy is when if you are monitoring uh, on a regular basis, you may see those leaf-footed bugs in their juvenile phase. Um, more um, together, like in a group. Uh, so you're not even um, getting them to, you're gonna 
cut them off before they mature into adults. And plus, once they become adults, they separate, so they're harder. You know, they're gonna go, they're gonna go make their own way in the world. So it's always best to prevent than to treat. Uh, the only other thing that we really didn't cover uh, here is um, are the tools. Uh, so we didn't go over really any tools, but you want to be sure that they're kept clean and they're maintained. Sometimes if you have a, um, a disease, uh, you can easily transmit it from one plant to another. So really be careful about that. Uh, one of the last things we'll go over are just knowing what resources that you have. Here in Texas, we have um, our AgriLife Extension. We have some really great resources. Uh, if you look at the, the four options up here, the, the website's actually um, at the bottom, aggiehorticulture.tmu.edu vegetable. And that bottom right option, vegetable problem solver, if you click there, it takes you to problem solvers, cucurbit or tomato. If you click on tomato, voila. Uh, it comes up with a lot of different pictures. So before you even have to reach out and ask questions, you can uh, try to figure it out on your own if you like that sort of thing and just match up the symptoms. So um, there's a lot of other resources here. I just wanted to include this uh, so, um, so you know that, um, you know that, there's, that there are places that you can go while you're at home. So a review, um, looks like a lot of words, but you know, we just went over all of this. Uh, so keep your garden easy to access. Um, continue to improve your soil um, each year and especially after soil tests. Make watering as easy and efficient as possible. Um, really, that that part is just uh, you want to keep gardening, and if if watering is just the you know the task that you don't necessarily enjoy, uh, make it as as easy as possible so it encourages encourages you to keep gardening. Don't overuse fertilizer. Uh, if you do, it it ends up it does end up in our waterways and um, choose based on your specific needs. Know when to plant, but as early as possible. And again, when to plant, your local extension office can help you. Control weeds to prevent competition. Monitor that garden and aim to prevent these problems. And then of course, contact your local extension office um, for questions. And here are some resources in links. Uh, we did, I think we added some. Uh, Shannon, are there, I would assume there are some questions. Uh, and we're about to get to all of them, I'm sure. I have included your email, so I'm sure you're going to be getting a lot of this these questions posed there. Um, real quick, um, what is the fuss on peat free compost? Uh, Paul, I'll let you answer that. Do you, are you familiar with that? Uh, well, I, I, I think that the, the concern is more um, a lot of the for container mixes. There are peat free mixes. There's no peat moss or or there is peat moss in it. Um, there are some that don't have peat moss like core and things like that. Um, the problem is, is when you, um, there, there are some people have issues with the bogs, uh, the harvesting of the bogs up in Canada and over in Europe. Um, but they, there is a lot of sustainability practice that practices that are already in place. So, um, I use, uh, you know, peat light mixes, uh, for my container. Uh, products and I never have any issues. Um, I am not, you know, uh, me personally, I'm not concerned with using a, uh, you know, peat based media or things like that. Okay. Um, Missy wants to know where, where do you recommend getting expanded shale? 
the soil yards would well depending on the quantity that you need um nature's way resources i know they carry it um probably the ground up you may need to call around um i have i i'm sure it's probably available as a bagged product but um it, again it's this is probably it's gonna it it, it can be pricey, so it's something that you might, if you're going to make that commitment to using expanded shale, um, you're probably going to have to purchase in bulk and have them deliver it and 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 drop it off for you. OK, um, should I keep going? Do you have time for more? Uh, let's let's do one more. OK. Um, OK, so there's two of them. I'm going to throw these in. Uh, what are the uh okay we talked a lot about vegetables but if there is a go-to fertilizer for vegetables one which one is the best one that can be used for all vegetables hmm. well we we tend not to um endorse any one particular product i think they're maybe using talking about like um your percentages kind of type thing uh, well, I mean, some common ones are like the 10, 20, 10 um, or the Osmocote. Actually, when you get in and I think maybe I, I'm not sure if I clarified this before, when you get into the um, container gardens with the slow release, a lot of those are um, all even 14, 14, 14, um, things like that. But, uh, you know, like common ones, um, you know, would be the 10, 20, 10 or uh, where that phosphorus is is doubled, even you know, depending if you need that. Is there a best fertilizer for tomatoes? Mm, I mean, I, I've always used just a general vegetable. Um, we do sell, like I know the master gardeners. They um, they're getting ready for their spring plant sale and they uh, I think they order through uh, what is that Paul it's on the tip of my um, tongue micro micro life yes yes and that's an organic based fertilizer um, and and Shannon I, I I will probably be touching a little bit on that on growing tomatoes and things like that uh, with a, maybe a little bit more detail because sounds great right you want to give them a starter uh, fertilizer but then once they set that first fruit uh, that's usually the sign to come in with a uh, a follow-up application um, when, once that plant goes from vegetative to reproductive uh, the requirements on the nutrition changes a little bit and it's pulling a lot of nutrients from the soil so you want to make sure they're there uh, and ready for that plant okay um, there's just uh, that I think that's all we have time for. There's just so many questions. Um, OK, well, we have a lot of resources. We have our um, Harris County Horticulture Facebook page. Uh, there is a Master Gardener page also. Uh, if you um, are not signed up for Paul's Spring Vegetable Talk uh, for um, in two weeks, we have reached the limit on that. We are kind of maxing out. But we actually have a, a master gardener talk next Monday through Houston Community College. I don't know if Paul, if you have that uh, link handy. Uh, so if um, you know that could be another source. Uh, so yeah, there's. And then for me, uh, I'll be back March 18th. Um, the whole talk will be about basil, so that's going to be that. That'll be fun. All right. Well, um, other than that, it sounds like you guys had a lot of questions. And if we get some of the similar same questions, perhaps uh, we'll just create some Facebook posts to help answer answer those, um, you know, for everyone else too, because they sound like they'd probably be more more common questions. So in two weeks, we have Paul Winsky with Spring Vegetable Gardens, and um, thank you for being here today.